Amen. <clears throat> All right, keep your place there in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23, a very powerful chapter talking about how, you know, how, what God feels about false prophets. It's a very powerful language in Jeremiah 23. You know, people that have perverted the words of the Lord. God says that they've stolen my words. He says that, you know, God actually says that he hates these people. In uh, Jeremiah 14, or Jeremiah 23, I'll just read for you verse 14 before we get started. I've seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of the evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me, as of Sodom and the inhabitants thereof, as Gomorrah. Obviously, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, that's how these people are to me these false prophets. So Jeremiah was out prophesying the truth and he was prophesying bad news and you had all these prophets at this time, you know, saying good news and good things and trying to say that they had dreams that weren't dreams of God and putting words into God's mouth. And God's very angry about it here in Jeremiah 23. So tonight we continue our American Heresy um, sermon series. Now tonight's heresy Definitely keep your place in Jeremiah 23. We're going to be going back and forth there. We're going to be going all over the Bible. We're going to have to get doctrinal tonight. I'm sorry to do that to you. No, I'm not. But we've got to look at some deep things tonight to uh, uncover this heresy. Tonight's heresy definitely fits our cult definition, first of all. Okay, it's, it's centered around a person, a man, uh, not necessarily a man in this case. But it also has, number two, it has extra-biblical materials, extra-biblical revelation, of course. Okay? It relies heavily on the fact that most people don't know what the Bible says. You know, this one's not quite as um, cartoonish as the Mormons last week, but it's just as evil, and I believe that it's a little bit worse than what we're dealing with um, with the Mormons. So before we get into tonight's cult, let me just give you some historical context. In New York in 1833, there was a man named William Miller. William Miller was, uh, I guess he went to a lot of Baptist churches, but he was a layperson in churches, and he came up with this um, doctrine or this prediction that the world would end in 1844. So he became this guy that was predicting the end of the world in 11 years, basically, he got published and his predictions, he, he drew up these maps according to his study of the Bible, and he had quite a following. There was people all over the country that were following this man. And, of course, um, 1844 came along, and guess what happened? The world did not end. So the Millerites, they, they consisted of all types of different people. You know, things were hard for most people back then. It, it was kind of an easy sell because people, you know, wanted to just get out of here at that time. There was a lot of working class people that followed William Miller and his prediction at the end of 1844. I mean, he predicted it to the day, October 22nd, 1844. We're out of here, folks. You know, by the way, um, not to sidetrack here, but this is a danger of imminency, imminency, okay? And I've actually met people like this. I've actually met people like this. There was a man at the church that we used to go to before we moved to California that I almost, I, I never, I stopped asking him how things were going. He was perpetually unemployed. His, his wife had left him. His son was a homo. I mean, things were as bad as they can get for this guy. And he was just not trying to make anything better in his life. And whenever you would ask him, you know, hey, brother, you know, how you doing? He's just like, I'm just waiting for Jesus to come back. And he was dead serious. He's just, he's just waiting for Jesus to come get him at any time. So he wasn't trying to do anything that the Bible told him to do in his life. He's just waiting for Jesus to just come get me. I mean, it's a danger. Not only does the Bible not teach it, the Bible says that things are, certain things are obviously going to happen before you know, that day, but it's just a danger, though, this mindset. And that's what happened in, eight, in the 1800s here. People were just waiting. They were just giving everything up and they were just waiting for 18, October 22nd, 1844 to happen. So, of course, 1844, October 22nd came and went. Nothing happened. Most Millerites disbanded, but there was this unusually faithful group that kept going. And these are today's Seventh-day Adventists. 
It's these gru this group of people, and there is a select group of the Millerites that had these visions that explained why William Miller's prediction was wrong. And the leader of this, or the, the most prominent figure of these Adventists who had these visions was a woman named Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White was a Millerite. She lived from 1827 to 1915. And she was one of the main founders of the Seventh-day Adventists. With, with her visions that she had, she became one of the most, up until her death, she became one of the most published women in history. Over 10,000 pages have been published to her credit. So, who is this woman? She was a Millerite. She, she was following this William Miller, and she claimed to have all these visions. You know, White, she married, and they started following with her husband. She married um, this man, which is uh, where her name came from. They studied a man named Joseph Bates who promoted Sabbath keeping. I'm not even really going to get into much on the Sabbath day stuff. I'll just disprove that with like two verses from the Bible. Done. But the problem is much more serious than Sabbath day keeping with the Seventh-day Adventists. She claimed to have all these visions confirming all these things, including the Sabbath day keeping. It's from her vision. It became a primary doctrine of the church because of her vision. You know, so, so basically she would just have these, she would just be overtaken, and she would have these visions in her life, her whole life pretty much. Turn to Mark chapter 5. But just some physical aspects. Let me give you some physical aspects of witnesses to her visions. They said she would stop breathing, though her heart kept beating, sometimes up to three hours. She would be... She would become, you know, superhuman with her strength. At one point, they said she held the family Bible in her hand for nearly a half an hour. When she came out of a vision, I'm going to turn back to Jeremiah 23 real quick. But when she came out of a vision, this is what would happen. All seemed total darkness, whether in the daytime or a well-lit room at night. She would exclaim with a long-drawn sigh as she took her first natural breath, dark. The word dark. She was then limp and strengthless. That's how her visions would always end, they said. Now, first of all, does this strike you as something from the Lord? I mean, look at Jeremiah 23 in verse number 12. I didn't even have this in my notes. But wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. I mean, come on. Look down at Mark 5. Mark chapter 5 and verse number 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Garden, Gardens. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him." Now look, I don't know if Ellen G. White was possessed by a demon or if it was just a hoax. I don't know. I mean, and, but I'm going to prove to you from the Bible tonight that it doesn't even matter. Because we have a test, we have what the Bible tells us as, as far as what to hold up against prophets to find out if they are false or not. And it's easy to see that Ellen G. White is a false prophet. So whether she was demon-possessed or she was just some trickster and she was in on this thing with her husband to sell books, matters not. She's still a false prophet. So let's look at some specific prophecies. These are my favorite parts of these sermons, by the way. Specific prophecies from Ellen G. White. The Civil War. This was happening right around um, in Ellen G. White's lifetime. She made several predictions about the Civil War. The first one was this. This nation will, ne will yet be humbled into the dust when England does declare war. All nations will have an interest of their own to serve and there will be general war, meaning world war. Well, England never declared war. You know, this nation wasn't turned to dust. Again, she prophesied about the Civil War. Thousands have, been, thousands have been induced to enlist with the understanding that this war is to exterminate slavery. But now that they are fixed, 
they find that they have been deceived, that the object of this war is not to abolish slavery, but to preserve it. Oops. I mean, she had a 50-50 chance at that one. She missed that one, too. So she basically said the Civil War was to preserve slavery and not to abolish slavery. And if you want to know what the Civil War was about, you know, see the Civil War sermon from several weeks ago. We preached on, or I preached on that here. She privately told people during the Civil War period to not have children because the, the world was about to end. She taught that salvation was only available to the Millerites because in the period of 1844 to 1850, um, she was receiving frequent public visions. She claimed on a number of occasions to have seen a vision. The door of salvation was shut for all those who were not part of the 1844 Millerite movement. The, the Adventists, though, rejected this in 1850 because this is bad for business, okay? I mean, seriously. I mean, I can just about imagine the meeting, right? Like, look, she had a vision that says nobody else can go to heaven except us five people. So we have to do something about this. Right, because we want more people than us five. Right, I mean, it's, so they did away with that one. All right. Now, of course, she predicted the end of the world. Of course, I mean, what, like I said, what kind of prophet would you be if you didn't predict the second coming of Christ, the end of the world, all these different things? Ellen G. White prophesied the world would end in 1843, 1844, 1845, and 1851. So that wasn't working out. She prophesied in 1851. Now the time is almost finished. And what we have been six years in learning is that we will have to learn in months. So then she starts making it more general, that it's coming in a few months, right, after 1851. The specific date thing wasn't working out. So at a conference in 1856, she says this. I was shown the company present at the conference. So it's like me talking to you folks here, right? I was shown all of you people here. Said the angel, turn to Matthew 24, by the way. Said the angel, this is her quote, some for food for worms, some subjects of the seven last plagues, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. All those people are dead now. Another one failed. Now here's, I mean, this just shows you how Ellen G. White didn't even know the Bible. Turn to Matthew uh, 24, verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. Make sure you turn there. Let's look at this verse. Because there's a couple things she missed on this one. But of that day or hour knoweth no man. Know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So first of all, nobody knows the day or hour. And second of all, the angels don't know either. I mean, so, so some angel told her that these people are going to see, you know, the end, and the angels don't know, the Bible says. Only the Father knows. Look, there, she has, we can't keep going. I mean, I wish we could just go through all this stuff, but there's all sorts of other prophecies, like visions on health, geology, genetics. I mean, she taught that back then, like, women had these things, what do they call them, were they like, make your, you know, make you really, like, have your waist like that. She taught that if you did that, it would become a genetic disorder and your children would be, like, born, like, with waist like that. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, this is what these Seventh-day Adventists today believe this, this woman was, was given visions from God. They believe that it's, it's, um, it's God-given prophecy. World population, this is another good one, then I'll stop. But she, pop, she, she predicted that if the world didn't end, that everyone was just going to die from disease. So she started getting really general with the endings because she was just like missing the mark constantly. So she's like, all right, but everyone's going to be die from disease. Because she, like, she was really this health kick type person. Like she predicted that like tea is bad for you, which tea is good for you. Coffee's bad for you. Coffee's, you know, good for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's heresy. Now, look, she predicted that if the world didn't end, that disease was going to take over and the entire world was going to be depopulated. So the population of the world at that time was about 1 billion in the 1850s. Today, it's like 7.5 billion people. So, I mean, there's another one. We could just keep going on and on and on. We could go on all night on just this one thing. So she's a false prophet. We know that for a fact. 
according to the Bible. Because what does Deuteronomy 18 say? It says that if it doesn't come true, then false prophet. Okay, that's what we learned last week. All right, now, the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. We have to get into this because it's, we're going to have to dive deep down this rabbit hole tonight. Their beliefs versus the Bible. The first thing is, they believe that Ellen G. White's prophecies are inspired from God. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. So we know that Ellen G. White's prophecies aren't inspired from God because they're false prophecies. And that's what the Bible tells us. Amen. In Jeremiah 23, 21, that we just read, the Bible says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. People just saying things that God didn't tell them to say. Look at 1 Timothy 6. Look at verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof come envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. I bet people made a lot of money off these publications of hers and all these followings that she had and these conferences that she had. They accepted a false prophet that was not sent by God. Okay? So how could this have happened? You wonder, how could this have happened? How could they just listen to some woman who just has all these visions and just says all these crazy things and, and fall for all of it? Well, here's how. The second belief is this. The Seventh-day Adventist belief on the Word of God is this, that the Holy Scriptures... Now, here's where they get tricky. All these false religions are very tricky in the way they word things. The Holy Scriptures are the infallible revelation of God's will. They do not believe... They believe that the Bible is God's thought inspiration. They do not believe the verbal... I know, it doesn't make sense. They do not believe the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Forget their wordiness and what they say. They don't believe that these are the literal words of God. That's how, they get, they fall, that's how people fall into these things. All right. So what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Turn to Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse 6. We read this last week. We have to read it again. Psalm 12, the middle of your Bible, you'll find the book of Psalms. Psalm 12 and verse number 6. They don't believe that the Bible's actual words are true. They believe that it's God's general will, it's His thoughts, you know, it's kind of the direction He wants us to go, all these types of things, okay? What does that lead to? What does the Bible say, first of all? The Bible says in Psalm 12, verse number 6, that the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. What is them? The words! From this generation forever. The words! You wonder why we're King James only? Because the individual words in this book matter. Amen. They matter. How many times have we gone through Romans, chapters in Romans, where we're like, you know what? If this word was changed, this would mean di something different. Yeah, that's right. If this word was changed, people take this out of context and don't read these words over here, this could be, mean something different. These words have to be preserved because every single word matters. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, I'll just read it for you. All Scripture is all Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. For correction. You see? So if I have the exact words of God and somebody says something stupid and unbiblical, I can correct them with these words. That's what the Bible says. That's why the words matter, folks. The words matter. You know, they also don't believe that God can keep His words. And so the Bible says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. They don't, they, they just, you can't believe that God can keep His words. If you don't believe, look, I don't care what religion you are, if you don't believe that the King James Bible 
is God's words, then you don't believe that God has the ability to keep His promises. You're calling God a liar. That's, it's as simple as that. Because the individual words matter. The minute you move away from this, enter Ellen G. White. This is where it goes. Look, if, if there's an error or a wrong word, we, we have a problem. I mean, if there's 1% that's wrong, and I don't know which 1% it is, can I trust any of it? No. That's why there, there is no errors in this book. That's why God promises, show me an error. Every single time you look in, I've looked into every single one of them, by the way. Every single time you go and you look at some person that says there's, there's contradictions in Scripture, and you dig into it, they, they just they don't know the Bible. It, it's too deep for them. It's too deep for them. They're on the surface up here, and the deepness of the Bible goes way down here and connects. That's what it is every time. Here's a third thing that they believe from Ellen G. White as well. That hell is not eternal. And with this, also soul sleep of the Christian. Ellen G. White said this, Upon the fundamental error of natural immortality rests the doctrine of consciousness in death. Meaning you're conscious while you're in hell. A doctrine like eternal torment. Opposed to the teachings of the Scriptures, she's a liar, to the dictates of reason, and to our feelings of humanity. She just, it sounds too mean for her. It sounds too mean for her. You know, what does the Bible say? Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'm going to read for you um, Jer uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 16. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart. Just because you don't feel that it's nice for God to put anyone in hell for eternity, it doesn't matter what you feel. What does the Bible say? 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9, the Bible says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power? Turn to Revelation 14. I'm going to read for you Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. I mean, is that hard to understand? Everlasting punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. It's everlasting in both cases. It's just like God was from everlasting to everlasting. Salvation is eternal, and so is damnation. God's a God of, of eternity. I mean, there, there's a theme here. Don't miss it. Revelation 14. And the smoke of their torment ascended up for two minutes. No. The smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. Look, if you just burn up, that's it. You have rest. You're done. If you just burn up and don't exist anymore, that, that's, the, that's not no rest day or night. The Bible says that the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. I mean, it's the most terrible thing you could possibly think of. Revelation 20. Verse 10. Turn to, I mean, it's, I believe this is why God did it this way. Because, first of all, He's just and holy and He must punish sin. But what could ever, what could drive you to salvation more than the thought of eternal punishment? I mean, that's, that's a good reason to, to be looking for some way out of that. Right. Revelation 20, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They're still there. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I mean, just again and again and again. I mean, it's all these hard-to-understand words like forever and ever like eternal, 
like everlasting. That's why it's so easy to explain salvation to people. Because these words are not hard to understand. Everybody knows what they mean. It's just, it's just, hell is forever, folks. Look, look, I mean, it's one thing to say, it's one thing to say that I just don't believe the Bible. I don't believe anything the Bible says. That's one thing. But if you actually claim to believe the Bible, there is no way around the fact that hell is forever. There is no way around that. Luke 16. I mean, Luke 16. I mean, the guy, he, he opened up his eyes and was in hell. Being in torments, the Bible says. Look, if you do believe the Bible, though, you had better run to someone who can give you the gospel because the Bible clearly teaches that hell is eternal punishment. It's that simple. You know, these, these people that we're talking to out here and these people that we're going out and we're seeing, they're, they're one heart attack away. They're, they're, they're one car accident away. They're one, they're one, they're one I mean, life is, is hang, their life is hanging on a thread and they're hanging on a thread over this pit of eternal damnation, eternal punishment. I mean, it's scary. If they only knew, if we could only get better at, at explaining that to people, is what I think a lot, a lot. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. We're not going to spend a lot of time on soul sleep for Christians because it's uh, easily, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense either. Amen. Right. Soul sleep for the Christian. 1 Thessalonians 4. This is the one that, this is the verse that they use to explain soul sleep that Ellen G. White used. For if we believe, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So does it say that they just lay in the ground and they're not anywhere? It says they sleep what? In Jesus. Turn to Philippians 1. Paul's talking about you know, leaving this earth. Paul, I mean, who thinks Paul had a good life? Who thinks Paul was on this earth just having a good time, you know, having, living the rich life, you know, eating grapes and having people fan him with big fans? You no, know, Paul's life was rough. He was having a tough time. And in Philippians 1 and verse 21, Paul says this, for, me, for, to me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says to die is gain. If I would just die right now, it's gain. Why? But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. So he's basically in this, you know, uh, wrestling match with himself, saying, you know what, these people need me to be edified. I need to be preaching the gospel to people. But you know, my, this, isn't, this isn't physically fun for me. And he's like, but I need to stay for you people, he says also other places in the Bible. But he's saying, look, to die is to, to be with Christ. It doesn't say that to, to die is to sleep for thousands of years. Do you think that if Paul knew that when we died, we just go to sleep for thousands of years, that he would want to die? And, and just sleep for thousands of years. No, he said to die is to be with Christ, which is far better. He doesn't want to hang out in the grave for thousands of years. Luke 16, the rich man, he lift up his eyes being in torments, and where was Lazarus? He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. He went to heaven. Right away. It, it's, it, it's not biblical. SDAs on the Sabbath. Seventh-day Adventists on the Sabbath day. From their website, the gracious creator, after the six days of creation, rested on the seventh day, instituted the Sabbath for all people as a memorial of creation. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of the seventh day Sabbath as of rest, worship, ministry, and harmony, which the teething and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. Turn to Romans 14. Romans 14. So it, it was one of her first visions, by the way. So they met this, her and her husband met this other false prophet, and he was really big on this, like, Sabbath day thing. And all of a sudden, she had a vision about it. So that's, that's where they base this doctrine, okay? And it's, it's just silly. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it either. Romans 14, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, 
One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I mean, <laughs> well, let's base a whole religion on, on what day of the week you think we should go to church on. I mean, should I read it again? One man esteemeth one day above another, meaning one person thinks one day is really important, and another esteemeth every day alike. One person thinks they're all the same. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Translation, it doesn't matter. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord doth he not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he that giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. You know, some things just don't matter, is basically what he's saying. You know, let us not just draw these doctrinal lines every single place. So, you know what? I bet you there's a lot of, you know, maybe certain opinions on things that we all don't have, you know, on things that don't matter that we maybe don't have the same ideas on in this church even. But some things just don't matter. Amen. The Bible matters. You know, what day? Maybe you like Wednesday more than I like Wednesday. I mean, should we break fellowship and never talk to each other again? I mean, it's just, it's just stupid. I mean, but the, the reason that these verses are in the Bible is because God knew that people would do dumb things like this, right. would come up with different things. Look, everyone wants to come up with something new and different and exciting. It sells. It makes people look like they're smart. If I ever get up here and start saying like, hey, I found some major doctrine in the Bible that no one's ever found before, just get out of here. Just go. Because, like, I'm, I've lost it, right? Please try to help me before you go, okay? Don't just leave me here with my family and my false doctrine. <laughs> okay, I mean, Hebrews 9.10. Let's just look at one more thing, and then we'll be done with the Sabbath day. Uh, you know, it's just basically talking about which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Look, all these cardinal ordinances were done away with with Christ, right. with the time of Re Reformation. Okay? Now, Jesus. Let's look at Jesus. Turn to Jude 1.9. What do the Seventh-day Adventists believe about Jesus? Jude 1.9. The Jesus of Adventism, the Jesus of Ellen G. White, is Michael the Archangel. Another vision. Quote from Ellen G. White. Get ready. The man Christ Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty. Nineteen oh three, towards the end of her life. Let's read Jude one nine because this is what they use. So I mean, let's see. Just just get yourself with the Holy Spirit right now. You got the Holy Spirit. We're going to read this together, and we're going to see if Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Okay. Jude one nine. Is everyone there? Yet Michael the Archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So Michael the archangel was having an argument, a dispute, a contention with the devil about the body of Moses. We don't know exactly what all that means, but he says that he, Michael d didn't want to bring a railing accusa accusation against the devil because that was the Lord's job. So Michael is saying, no, that's not for me to do, that's for the Lord to do. So who's the Lord? There's two, there's two people in this passage. Who's the Lord? Turn to John 20, 28. I mean, do you people know who the Lord is? Man. John 20, 28. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead and Thomas had doubted and then Thomas put his, his hands in the holes. And Thomas answered and said unto him, after he knew, after he knew that Jesus, it was really Jesus. And Thomas said unto him, My Lord and my God, he said. Amen. Now, did Jesus rebuke him? Because that's just Thomas. Look at verse number 29. Jesus say unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed that I am the Lord. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. He didn't rebuke him. Romans 13, 14, I'll just read it for you. Turn to Ephesians 4. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's even silly to go into this. 
that Jesus is the Lord. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. Ephesians 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the, voca the vocation wherewith you are called. Jesus is the Lord. Turn to Leviticus 16. Look, we're still on Jesus here. It gets worse. Okay, so Jesus is not the Michael the Archangel. You're off of that now, right? Ellen G. White taught that our sins would be put on Satan and not Jesus. Quote, He will come to the door of the tabernacle or the door of the first apartment and confess the sins of Israel upon the head of the scapegoat. She taught that this scapegoat, the person who the sins of the world would be put upon, was Satan, is who she equated the scapegoat in the Bible to. Okay? Now, this gets a little deep. Leviticus 16 talks about the Day of Atonement. I just want to look at three things in the Day of Atonement. Three things. I want to start reading in Leviticus 16 and chapter 8. We're talking about casting lots and this thing that they were supposed to do with these two goats in the Bible on the Day of Atonement. This happened once a year to atone for the sins of the nation. Okay? This is what God prescribed for them to do. And Aaron shall cast lots upon two goats, one lot for the Lord and other, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So the Lord's lot fell on the, the goat, one of the goats. And that goat was killed. He was offered. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And skip down to verse number 21 for sake of time. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. He shall lay and put his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of the fit man into the wilderness. He is sim symbolically putting the sins onto the head of this goat of the nation. Okay? And the goat shall bear upon him, shall bear upon him, the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat into the wilderness. You see, Jesus encompasses this whole thing. Okay? And I want to point out three things. Jesus encompasses, see, this was all a picture. In Hebrews, the Bible says it's a foreshadowing of things to come. This was all a picture of the coming Christ. All right? Now turn to Hebrews chapter 7. The first thing I want to show you is that Jesus, Aaron was the priest. Jesus is the high priest. In Hebrews 7, look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek but after, and not be called after the order of Aaron? So you have this order of Melchizedek and you have this order of Aaron. Aaron was this order of Levitical priests. Him and his sons and his sons' sons and his sons' sons' sons would carry on this order. In verse 23, And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death because they would just die. They would get old and die. But this man, because he continued ever, continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He never has to be replaced. This is talking about Jesus Christ, the high priest. He never has to be replaced. It was all just a picture. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as whose high priest to offer up sacrifice, First for his own sins. You see, Aaron had to kill. Aaron was a high priest, and he had to kill an animal for himself first. Jesus didn't have to do that. Why? Because Jesus had no sin. Aaron had to sacrifice for himself. He was the per Jesus was the perfect high priest. Look, there's a lot here, and I'm kind of skimming over it. I just want to make three points here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. You see, Jesus... Jesus was the perfect high priest. 
He never has to be replaced. He never has to have a sacrifice for himself because he never sinned. Look at Hebrews 4.15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus felt everything you feel. He felt all your temptations, all your desires, all your, temp all your proclivity for sin, yet without sin. But he was, but was all in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was the perfect high priest. He never had to be replaced. He never had to sacrifice for himself. Number two, and from Leviticus 16, we have the two goats. The Lord's lot fell on one of the goats. The Lord's lot fell on Christ. Remember Barabbas? One was chosen and one was let go. This was a picture of what was to happen to Christ. One was chosen to die, and one was let go. The Lord's lot fell upon Christ. Barabbas was freed. Look at Leviticus 16, verse 8. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. The Lord's lot fell on Jesus. You think that these things, all this was put in place to happen exactly how God wanted it to happen. From the Jews wanting to kill him, from the Jews choosing to let Barabbas go and crucify Jesus, that was the Lord's lot falling upon him. And then, number three, Christ bore the sins of the whole world personally, himself. He, you see, he's the whole thing. He's the high priest, and he's the, he's the whole sacrifice. Where the priest put his hands on the live goat, and, and, and he lay the sins of the nation on that live goat. Christ, the Bible actually teaches you. say, oh, you're just saying that. Turn to Hebrews 9.28. You know what? Turn to Isaiah 53.6. I'm going to read for you Isaiah 28, 9.28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Look, he was off. That's another thing. They did this every single year. If you read the last verse of Leviticus 16, you say that every year they will do this. Again and again and again. And it wasn't to take away the sins because it says the blood of bulls and goats. It's not possible that it can take away sin. It was a picture of the coming Christ. And Jesus fulfills the whole thing. The whole thing. Look at Isaiah 53 and verse number 6. My last point is that Jesus bore the sins of the world personally. Personally. And the Bible reads, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone unto his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you see the importance of the words in the Bible? They, he laid on him the, the iniquity. Just like, just like the goat. It's a perfect picture. The words in the Bible matter. And God can preserve His words. First Peter 2, verse 24. I use this one all the time, soul winning. Turn to First Peter 2, verse 24. I'm going to read for you 2 Corinthians 5.21 while you're turning there. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In 1 Peter 2.24, as far as Jesus bearing the sins of the world, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whom stripes we are healed. He bare them in his own body. They were on him. Yep. This, this Satan is, is the, the sins of the world are on Satan. You know, burn in hell. Yep. Amen. For even saying that. For that one thing. Look, Christ had all the sins laid on him. Turn to Hebrews 9:12. Jesus is a perfect picture of the whole thing in Leviticus 16. I just want to just show you this one last thing. And it's better. It's better. He's a better sacrifice. Yes, yes, right. Hebrews 9.12 
The Bible says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood, He entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. How long are you saved? Eternally. Verse 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are of the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that He should offer Himself often. He doesn't have to do it again. As the high priest entereth into the holy place every year. Look at the last verse of uh, Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you, to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. Every single year. In verse 25, yet that it should, he should offer, yet, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He did it once. It's better. It's perfect. It's complete. It's done. It's eternal. If you could lose your salvation and you would have to get it again, the Bible says you would be crucifying Christ afresh. This is why the veil rent in the temple. Because it was done. I mean, just more stupidity. More stupidity, by the way, is that... I wasn't going to go into this, but I'll just explain it real quick. In 1844, she taught that one of the reasons she said that the Millerite, that William Miller's prophecy was wrong, because, oh, he just he misunderstood what was going to happen. Because Jesus... Turn, uh, turn to, I just thought of something. Turn to Acts, uh, Acts 2. We love this verse, soul winning. But she's like, hey, Jesus, um, he really didn't come back. He just went into the Holy of Holies and he's, clean, he's cleansing it. So Jesus has been cleaning for the last 115 years or whatever. Where, where, where is Jesus? Where's Jesus? Maybe the Bible will tell us. Look at verse 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see, see corruption. So his flesh was on earth in the tomb, and it didn't see corruption, because guess what? And I know this, like, perfectly, because like after about three days, an animal starts to smell. Flesh starts to smell. You know, if you've ever had an animal die or anything like that on a farm or whatever, you know that it's almost like clockwork. After the third day, it's like, we better get that thing out of here. Or, Garrett, get that thing on the rock pile because it's going to start to smell. And his flesh didn't see that corruption. But his soul went to hell, the Bible says. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Twice. He's sitting on the right hand of God. He's not cleaning anything. Amen. The Bible says that over and over again. He, Jesus Christ is on the right hand of God. Amen. Amen. It's just made up. They're just stealing words from the Lord. They're perverting the prophecy of God. Leviticus 16 is a picture. You see? It's a perfect picture, and Christ paints it perfectly. It's complete. He's the high priest. The Lord's lot fell on him, and he bore all the sins on himself. So the point I'm trying to make is Seventh-day Adventists, different Jesus! Completely different guy. He's not where they say he's supposed to be. He didn't bear the whole sins of the whole world. And let's, let's look at salvation. What do they think on salvation? Maybe they have that right. The experience of salvation. This is their words, not mine. In infinite love and mercy, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that in Him we might be made the righteousness of God, led by the Holy Spirit, we sense our need, acknowledge our sinfulness, repent of our transgressions, and exercise faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Substitute and example. In righteousness by faith. They even have a section called righteousness by faith. Sounds pretty good. First of all, they just said repent of our transgressions. Okay, maybe they just didn't know what they were writing there. Righteousness by faith. 
Righteousness by faith included both justification and sanctification. Our standing before God rests both in the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. Justification is for sins committed in the past only. As if the sins that Jesus died for, first of all, none of us were even here 2,000 years ago. Amen. As if the sins that Jesus died for were like only the future sins of Brother Ryan that were right up to his point of salvation. And then we have an imaginary line we draw. It, you see? It's stupid. On assurance of salvation, but wait, there's more. Assurance of salvation. Our standing before God rests in both the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. Assurance, assurance of salvation before the judgment is presumptuous. So you can't be assured, it says. You know, drum roll. Drum roll. It's works. I mean, all that. I know, I hope it gets more exciting as we keep going through this, this series. But it's just, I mean, it's just false prophecy. It's works. It's heresy. They I mean, they have the wrong Jesus. They believe in extra-biblical stupidity that is nearly as bad as Mormonism. It might not be as cartoony, but there's more false pro Maybe not, I don't know. There's just like so many false prophecies, it's crazy. I mean, it gets even better because she blamed... When, I mean, don't you think somebody brought up that like, you know, hey, you know, the world didn't end and you said it was going to end. What's up with that? I mean, people probably brought that up, right? You know what she blamed it on? It's like if I stood up here and I said, hey, you know, Jesus is coming back like tomorrow and then tomorrow goes by and we all meet up on Thursday night for Romans 14 and you guys are like, hey man, what's up? Jesus didn't come. And I'm like, you know what? It's because of your lack of faith. <laughs> You're all backslidden. He was coming. And he canceled his ticket. Because of you. No, I'm serious. This is what she did. Again and again and again. People are Seventh-day Adventists today. Can you believe it? I mean, it's a cult. Amen. It's a cult. It's not Christian. You know when you don't believe in the Bible literally, when you don't believe this is literally God's Word, first of all, if I didn't believe this was literally God's Word, I, I wouldn't believe any of this. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I was honest with myself and I, be and I believed that there was even errors in here, I, I wouldn't believe any of it. Any, but at, at that point, when you've gotten to that point, and you say that you don't believe that, you know, that these are literally God's words, anything goes. I mean, anything goes at that point. You know, it's not like, look, it, it's not like God hasn't warned us. Well, I mean, just Jeremiah 23. I mean, I just love hearing Jeremiah 23. Just spoken. I just love it. This is why we are Baptist. This is why so many people are mad at us all the time. Because the Bible is our boss. Amen. Period. And I will die upon that belief. Amen. And we all should. These are not so, I mean, look, when we have this as our boss, we are impossible to fool. Amen. Because this word, this, this, the screen of this book is a fine mesh, and none of this stuff will get through. Right. Because it's perfect. And it will clear out all the false doctrine. And you just filter any doctrine that comes in, you just filter it through the words of the Bible, and it will catch it all. Every last piece. So when somebody tells you that Seventh-day Adventists, because you'll hear this more often than the Mormon thing, that Seventh-day Adventists are Christians, and it's just another denomination of Christians, no, they're not Christians. They believe in a different God than you do. They believe in a different Jesus than you do. They believe in the prophecies of a woman. They believe she was inspired by God when she said, Jesus is not the Lord Almighty. Different God. These are not small differences. 
Seventh day Adventism. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the fact that it is perfect. We thank you for the fact that we can hold in our hands your perfect, preserved word. Lord, I pray that, you know, you never let us take that for granted. You always remind us that, you know, people have died to, to have the privilege that we have here today. Lord, I pray that, you know, all these heresies that you just help us completely filter them through the, through the perfect fine screen of your world. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.